Your Excellency, Matthias Gorman, dear Rector, dear President, Honorary Rector, uh, Vice Rectors, dear colleagues, students and alumni here in the room, but also online, it really is an honor to welcome today the OECD Secretary General. It's a pleasure for me to stand here, in particular with my portfolio, which includes international policy, interculturality and alumni policy. International policy, of course, because we are having as a guest speaker today a global citizen, born as a Belgian, having uh, had his education in three languages, the three national languages of Belgium, and then moving along uh, for, as an Erasmus student to uh, the UK, but then becoming an Australian after having migrated to that country. Uh, it is clear that uh, this global uh, dimension that we want to bring into our university for every student and every staff member uh, is, of course, already realized by you, so you're a great example of that. But at the same time, um, you also have been uh, an important person, political person, in a country where diversity uh, is a key challenge to deal with. Not only um, uh, the Australian society uh, has included lots of migration uh, populations, but there also is uh, the very important and um, very carefully designed policy committed to the peoples and the cultures that traditionally have occupied the land in Australia. And of course, with my third uh, uh, aspect in the portfolio of being responsible for alumni policy, it's of course uh, a great pleasure to host an alumnus of our law faculty in such a high position and after such a successful career so far, because uh, we know there is much more to come. Um, it also is a pleasure meeting you again, uh, dear Mr. Corman, uh, after we had this uh, very pleasant uh, encounter in Perth, uh, now four years ago. It was a memorable visit um, uh, to Australia a couple of uh, weeks uh, before we came uh, into this uh, pandemic situation here in Belgium and already there we could notice quite a few consequences of what that was at the, what at that time was happening, uh, maybe exclusively in China. Of course, at that time, we already wanted you to come to uh, Leuven uh, to deliver a speech in your capacity as Minister of Finances uh, of, uh, of Australia, as a very important member of the Australian cabinet, actually several ones. It would have been a great honor to to host you. We then actually wanted you to talk about the Australian policy, for instance, on sustainability, uh, which was uh, at that moment a bit controversial according to European perspectives. Uh, you may remember the discussions we had about that. But then COVID came. Uh, and meanwhile, meanwhile, a lot has happened in Australia. Not only COVID, but also more recently we have experiences with happenings in uh, Australia and also the politics in your country has changed a bit since then. So now here you are. Uh, today we will hear about the role OECD is playing in education, in higher education. You may touch upon other topics as well. And uh, we are also very delighted that our rector, uh, Luc Sels himself, is here with us to introduce uh, your talk, your talk which will be about how uh, we make higher education future-proof, key findings and insights from the OECD. I'm very much looking forward to the answer. If you have the uh, uh, one and uh, only answer that you can think of uh, to, to make higher education future-proof. Uh, but before doing that, let me just uh, uh, give a couple of remarks about, or, or a, a brief summary of your uh, CV as sixth Secretary General of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. You started your term now two and a half years ago. So you're in the middle of a five years term. Um, uh, we will have uh, the Guy Leuven audience questioning you. May, so maybe you can consider this as a midterm evaluation of what you have been doing so far in this post. Um, when looking to the OECD page uh, describing your roles, um, it really is about a lot. Eh? It is about optimizing strength and quality of the post-COVID recovery, 
uh, but then also including uh, all the effects and all the economic and societal impacts that are uh, because of the war in Ukraine and other conflicts in the world. Leadership on climate action um, is an important aspect uh, where we all are uh, striving for net zero in global net zero in 2050, but at the same time making sure that uh, what policies are, um, uh, are uh, lined out are effective and fair. There is a digital transformation which comes with uh, challenges, risks, I guess also in, uh, in uh, education and higher education. Well, functioning of global markets and the global level, level playing field um, and also global engagement. Now, this is a role that uh, you could very well prepare for, I think, uh, through your political career. Um, in Australia, you have been um, Australian Minister for Finance uh, for a quite long period. Uh, I think it was something like seven years uh, uh, under three uh, prime ministers. So with uh, lots of experience, you have also been the leader of the government in the um, Australian Senate and federal senator representing the state of Western Australia, which is, I think, uh, still your home. Um, in these roles, you have been a strong advocate for the positive power of open markets, free trade, and the importance of a rules-based international trading system. Um, and as many of you may have um, um, uh, <clears throat> guessed already, um, uh, Matthias Korman was born and raised in the German-speaking part of Belgium. He migrated to Australia already in 1996. Um, uh, if I I'm well informed, attracted by the lifestyle, the great lifestyle and the opportunities that Western Australia is offering. And having be been there only once for a very short visit, Western Australia, I mean, I think I know what you are referring or you were uh, referring to at that time. Before migrating to Perth, you, and that is very important for us, graduated from Kai Leuven uh, uh, Faculty of uh, Law and that following your studies at the Université de Namur. So you are really uh, a Belgian citizen, or you were uh, with education in, um, in both languages, as I mentioned already. And you also had an Erasmus student exchange at the University of East, East Anglia. So we probably also could have invited you to speak in French or in uh, Dutch, see how it comes. Uh, but uh, with that, um, um, I just have one other, other remark to make, and I don't know if this has something to do with the long flight that is between uh, Australia and uh, Europe. You also have a private pilot's license. Um, with that, I uh, would like to, uh, well, I just want to say that I'm looking very much forward to your speech, but first, uh, it is my great pleasure to give the floor to uh, our Rector Lixels to introduce uh, the topic of today. Thank you. Secretary General Corman, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, um, Mr. Corman, welcome home. Um, Leuven is one of the many places that have been, I believe, a magnificent, fascinating career. I sincerely hope that this little somewhat hidden gem in Western Europe still feels like home to you. Uh, you received part of your education here, as Peter already explained. Let education be the theme for today, so it's a perfect match. Uh -huh. I have the very best memories of our previous meeting. Peter already referred to that splendid evening in Perth, a delightful dinner in Perth, February 2020. The um, photographer, photographer was so impolite not to wait for my big smile, but you clearly compensated for that, so thank you for that. At that time, as was already explained, you were Minister of Finance in Australia. We discussed various topics, but I'm quite sure not the OECD nor education at that time. 
It was a very peculiar moment. A few weeks before, lockdowns were enforced in large parts of the world. And as Peter already explained, our stay in Australia, the stay for the Belgian delegation in those weeks, served really as a wake-up call. Down under the enormous economic effects of an advancing pandemic were already visible, especially in Australian higher education, due to its significant, to the, to its significant dependence on the then disrupted influx of Chinese students. Today, your position has significantly changed with your appointment as Secretary General of the OECD. And I assume that your life is now centered in Paris and in many places around the world. I wouldn't rule out that I have spent more days down under in recent months than yourself. Um, either way, your career connects many remarkable places on this planet, and I want to sincerely thank you for revisiting one of those places, Leuven, for this ambassador's lecture. A short comment on OECD. We all know the OECD as a platform for economic coordination, a platform to coordinate socioeconomic policies of the member countries, but OECD is far more than that. In my current position as rector, I have mainly had a role as policy advisor in 2021, and that is just one single example. OECD conducted an influential, a truly influential study on the resourcing, the funding of higher education in Flanders. And reading the final report, I do not agree with all the recommendations and think that some even may jeopardize the uniqueness of the Flemish system but I welcomed the study because it holds up a mirror, and that is so typical for OECD reports. It holds up a mirror. It's much more meticulous than what we are used to in most other consulting reports, and above all, it brings an outsider's perspective and international comparison to our own position. OECD's work also has great relevance for scientific research. My main domain is labor market research and transition from education to labor market. And obviously this work has become indispensable in such areas of economic research, and I may say even in social sciences in general. Few organizations have your ability to bring together data on outcomes, the link between the two, in a coherent way to benchmark appropriately and to develop standards and best practices for our own policies. As researchers, we will continue to be critical interlocutors for OECD, but also grateful partners, happy to encourage you to continue the good work. A few comments on PISA. Several members of our own Flemish parliament would have loved to have joined us here today, but unfortunately, the Flemish Parliament's Education Committee is meeting at this very moment. And I suppose they will be talking about the same topic, the disastrous PISA results for Flanders, Belgium, and large parts of Europe. Everyone is talking about PISA these days, but for those who lived on a separate planet for the last two weeks, and didn't read any newspapers. Just a very brief introduction, PISA is an OECD comparative study that tests the learning performance of 15-year-old school students in a very large group of 81 countries, if I'm informed correctly, including the, 38, the current 38 OECD member countries. It assesses reading, mathematical, and scientific literacy levels. And we all know by now that results are poor, not the results of the OECD study that was crafted very decently, no doubt, but the results of the assessment. The poor results should not cause panicky reactions or finger pointing at students, teachers, or schools. I myself interpret the results as a wake up call that should spur action and more systemic vision. There are even reasons for optimism very important to underline that, since some of the countries show that the curve can be turned, also European countries. 
The PISA results are a wake-up call for us as a university too, not only because young people's proficiency determines the quality of our future intake, but also because government and society expect universities to make even more efforts to improve the quality of compulsory education. And it is actually what we try to establish today with the organization of our own school of education and a round of, I may say, quite solid improvements in our own teacher training programs. There is criticism to the OCD study. Some commentators argue that PISA is too economically oriented, assumes competition between countries, that it is about ranking countries. As if economic thinking is a plague or a form of intellectual reductionism. But let me, being the former dean of the Faculty of Economics and Business, share two reflections. First, and very important to underline, you do not need to compare with other countries to conclude that crucial skills here in Flanders are in sharp decline and to feel a sense of urgency. That's one. Second, very important from an economic perspective, a country's position and how it evolves over time is an important measure of its future human capital and thus of relative economic growth potential. Pointing that out is not a reductionist reflex. It is strategic information for a region, a country, that is relying so heavily on its brains, on its human capital. And although differences between countries remain large, PISA shows an unprecedented decline in learning performance across Europe. It is this finding that worries me most. There are good examples, Estonia, Ireland, Switzerland, to mention the three most important. And these nearby positive benchmarks are important as sources of inspiration. But the most impressive results we find in Singapore, Japan, China. I recommend it, it's just a side note, I recommend you all to read Kishore Mabubani's book, Has China Won? An impressive work. Anyone still in doubt about the answer to that question should look into the details of the PISA study and at the huge boom in talent development in that so large country. I could go deeply, and I conclude on PISA, I could go deeply into the required reforms in our own educational system, but I'm not a keynote speaker here today. It's, I don't have to set the tone here. It suffices here simply to point out that first, the negative trend confirms the need for our own educational system at different layers and in wider society and that the PISA results show the importance of standardized measurements such as those now being developed in Flanders. If you use, and the wording is very important, if you use standardized measures wisely, I repeat, if you use standardized measurements wisely, the results can provide extremely valuable information and the PISA results are proof to that. Just one single example, this figure that I show here was developed by our own Kai Leuven colleague, Orhan Agirdag, but based on the Dutch and Toetsen, the final test in the Dutch compulsory education, and each dot in the diagram is a school. The outcome nicely shows with performance levels on the vertical axis and the diversity in student pupil population, student populations on the horizontal axis, the outcome nicely shows that differences in aggregated proficiency between schools are large within the same country, not only in Flanders and Belgium, but also in the Netherlands, but also that in schools with very diverse pupil populations, positioned on the right side of the figure, and here, uh, also um, pointed at with the green uh, circle, we find schools with excellent scores. So assessment of what those schools have in common is a very important step for benchmarking purposes and developing standards, simply to show the importance or to underline the importance of having 
standardized measurements and no the use of standardized tests because that is part of the debate in Flanders. The use of those tests need not restrict freedom of education at all. Freedom of education and the local ownership that comes with it have made our education in Flanders great. Implementing standardized testing can help to balance between autonomy and accountability, between the freedom to experiment at school level, local entrepreneurship on the one hand, and accountability to society on the other. Ladies and gentlemen, I conclude just saying that OECD is more than PISA, and also more than PISA in the area of educational research. OECD covers a broad spectrum of themes related to education and allow me to touch as a final note on a few themes of great importance. And my apologies for the very blurry picture to the left, which indicates a very important study, that's the PIAC study. OECD is also responsible for the so-called PIAC survey, the survey which in, in which Flanders also participates, that provides insight into how well adults adults, not 15-year-old, but adults master core skills and how they use them both at home and at work. These include literacy, numeracy, and problem solving in technology rich environments. Again, also here, the results for quite a few countries are worrying, with very large differences between countries, but in all countries also large differences between the highly educated and the medium and low educated. New data from the second cycle will be available for Flanders in 2024. And I hope that the results like PISA does for compulsory education will create a basis for decisive policy on lifelong learning. That then touches on one of Kai Leuven's current strategic priorities and the question of what role universities should take on regarding, should take on regarding adult learners. There are, of course, also the many findings from education at a glance, the overarching reports of the OECD, but also the many specific reports the organization produces also for higher education and often, as I explained earlier, at the request of governments. There are so many debates here in Flanders for which OECD can help us with sound research in an international competitive perspective. And to conclude with a few examples, the way student intake in higher education is organized and our Flemish choice to opt for open access the comparison between open, semi-open, semi-open and closed funding models for higher education. The funding per student and the comparison with investment levels in other countries. The relationship between education, labor market entry and social inequality. The question of the optimal share of highly educated people in society, a very topical debate also in Belgium the importance of international mobility, and to mention just a final one, the future, the development of future curricula given the speed of transition and transformation, for example, driven by developments in AI and data science. Dear Secretary General, I'm happy to give you the floor for your perspective on education and the challenges that await us in the future because that is what brings us together here today. Thank you once again for, invite, for accepting the invitation. The floor is yours. Rector Luc Sels, geachte gasten, allereerst uitnodiging om u hier in mijn alma mater toe te mogen spreken. Het is een groot genoegen om weer uit KU Leuven terug te zijn. Het voelt nog niet zo lang geleden dat ik hier woonde op mijn kot in de Vlamingenstraat. Dat is totdat ik naar het objectieve bewijsmateriaal kijk en besef dat het in feite zo'n 30 tot 33 jaar geleden was. 
Zoals u allemaal heel goed weet, is KU Leuven zowel een van de oudste universiteiten van Europa, met wortels teruggaand tot 1425, als een centrum voor baanbrekend onderzoek en excellentie op het gebied van biomedische wetenschappen, techniek, sociale wetenschappen en natuurlijk rechten. KU Leuven is dus een passende plek om te bespreken hoe we ervoor kunnen zorgen dat het hoger onderwijs ons kan blijven helpen de vele economische, sociale en politieke uitdagingen aan te gaan waarmee we in deze zeer onzekere wereld geconfronteerd zijn. In many areas, uh, the OECD has uh, taken on the job to probe, measure and compare the progress made in higher education to help facilitate further improvements. And that is what PISA is all about too. Yes, there are rankings, but the rankings are there for a purpose. It's to show what works well, what perhaps doesn't work so well, and to inspire countries who want to improve, to look at what works well elsewhere and work to adjust and adapt it to their own circumstances. But I want to stress at the outset that some of the most important benefits of higher education cannot actually be measured, recorded, or calculated in a spreadsheet. It's a point made in different ways by many scholars, but to quote an Australian writer, uh, Clive James, uh, true learning does not need to serve a purpose, he wrote in his book, Cultural Amnesia. It has always been part of the definition of humanism that true learning has no end in view except its own furtherance, he wrote. Education should never be simply utilitarian. But of course, dynamic, open, and globally oriented higher education systems have a fundamental role to play in helping us tackle so many of the challenges policymakers are facing today. That includes the skills needed in labor markets as they are transformed by technology, the digital and green transitions, evolving patterns of globalization, and of course, the aging of our societies. It means fostering the research and innovation necessary to boost growth and accelerate productivity, including in cutting edge areas like artificial intelligence. It is also indispensable to help us navigate geopolitical tensions or the challenges of misinformation and disinformation through scholarly exchange, developing and communicating a common understanding of contemporary challenges from pandemics to tensions in the global trading system, or indeed how best to tackle the challenge of ensuring income security in retirement in the context of population aging on the foundation of sustainable pension systems, something that is top of mind because we discussed it at the OECD yesterday when launching our pensions at a glance report 2023, supported by one of the professors from the economics department here at KU Leuven. Uh, for its part, uh, the OECD has been providing uh, policymakers with analysis and advice on tertiary education for more than 20 years. The OECD has been conducting country reviews since 2004 and published our landmark tertiary education for the Knowledge Society study back in 2008, which provided policymakers with new internationally comparable data on trends in the sector. And when we look at the 15 years since that study was first published, the proportion of the adult population across OECD countries with a tertiary education has increased from under 30% to about 41%. Higher education is, at its core, about nurturing and drawing out the best of human potential, opening up opportunities, broadening horizons. It's about inspiring people to apply their talents and their passion to be their best selves, pursuing a purposeful and fulfilling life and career. My own university experience mainly here in Belgium, was certainly a transformative for me. Uh, studying law first at uh, Notre Dame University, as it was called then, in Namur, but then here at the KU Leuven, including a one-year stint as an Erasmus student at the University of Ang East Anglia, and as the first member of my family ever to attend a university, those years as a university student certainly opened up my horizons and helped me pursue opportunities well beyond my imagination 
as a child growing up. It equipped me with knowledge, yes, but much more importantly, it equipped me with an intellectual curiosity, with analytical tools and a confidence that have helped me tackle challenges and pursue opportunities ever since. As it turned out, I migrated to Australia in the mid-1990s. It could be argued that my Belgium law degree was perhaps not the best preparation for a career in the law in Western Australia at that time. But what appeared as a career challenge at first worked out as a great opportunity because it was what ultimately channeled me more exclusively into the profession of public service through politics. As a child growing up in Raren, a village in the German-speaking community of East Belgium, I could never have imagined that one day I would serve as a federal member of the Australian Parliament, let alone as the Finance Minister of Australia and then as the Secretary General of the OECD. And my time as a law student at University in Namur coincided with a major historic event that had a significant impact on my outlook on life and the world. And I will get back to the higher education theme in a minute. In 1989, my second year in what was then called a candidature in law is when the world witnessed the fall of the Berlin Wall, some 34 years ago now. After that wall came down, which had always been there during my time growing up, a couple of friends and I decided to jump in a car and make the 600-kilometer journey from Namur to Berlin to be part of history. And what struck me at the time and in the months and years that followed was how political and policy, political values and policy choices could have such a massive impact on people's living standards, their quality of life, and importantly, their future opportunities. To me, Berlin in the 40 years between 1949 and 1989 is the ultimate longitudinal case study on how political and policy choices can have wildly different impacts on people's prospects and quality of life. Because in Berlin, after the Second World War, you had the same people, the same post-war challenges and opportunities, the same economic and social climate, the same starting point. But on one side, you had a political system committed to individual freedom, free enterprise, reward for effort and risk-taking, market-based economic principles, underpinned by a commitment to a social safety net, to social protection and cohesion. On the other side of the wall, it was a drive towards equality of outcomes, which led to lowest common denominator outcomes and over time significantly lower living standards and a significantly lower quality of life. And after a decade or so, between 1949 and the late 1950s, the differences became so obvious, so stark, that it required the building of a wall and increasing levels of authoritarian government control to force people to stay. It marked my view of the world and led me to several conclusions that I continue to carry with me to this day. Her politics and political choices matter. Her policy values and principles matter. Her individual freedom, freedom of thought and expression and market-based economic principles are a powerful driver of innovation, progress and improvements in living standards. However, public policy must work to ensure we can deliver on the democratic promise of equality of opportunity, to ensure everyone has the best possible opportunity to participate in and benefit from economic development and growth and to be able to get ahead in life. That there is an appropriate level of support, including a guarantee of timely and affordable access to essential public services and social protection for those less fortunate. And that there is access to high quality education, including merit-based access to high quality higher education, a key driver of delivering on that democratic promise. And as a direct beneficiary of that commitment in Belgium, let me say from personal experience that this is something Belgium does very well. Looking more objectively at the data rather than looking at it just from an ad hoc personal point of view, uh, tuition fees are at the lower end across the OECD uh, here in Flanders and Financial support is well targeted to students from financially disadvantaged families. Going back to the Berlin case study for a moment, West Germany had opened themselves up to the world, engaging in open trade, committing to international competition. They built an outward-looking, globally focused and globally exposed open trading economy, which is what drove 
the economic miracle, the Wirtschaftswunder in post-war West Germany. But West Germany had also focused on the social dimension of the market economy, framing it as the soziale Marktwirtschaft, the social market economy. And the differences in approach extended to every area of policymaking, including higher education. Research has shown that after reunification, more young people in East Germany aimed to pursue higher education because the opportunities had grown, some barriers to access had been lifted, and no doubt because of a desire to pursue knowledge in an environment of open and free thought. Experience also shows that countries which respect human rights that have democratic values and that harness the power of market-based economic principles are in the best position to fully benefit from the contribution made by higher education. In OECD countries, 86% of 25 to 34 year olds with a tertiary education qualification are employed. 86% of 25 to 34 year olds with a tertiary education qualification are employed compared to 59% of those with less than a high school education. In the same age group, individuals with a tertiary qualification in OECD countries earn, on average, 38% more than their counterparts of the same age with only a high school leaving qualification. Graduate earning advantages have also remained steady or even increased despite a substantial increase in the flow of graduates into OECD labor markets over the last two decades. The average tertiary education attainment rate among young adults in OECD countries has grown from 28% in 2002, some 21 years ago, to 47% in 2022, and, and that rate is even higher here in Belgium, where it increased from the same 28% but to 51% over the same period. Across the OECD, higher education is also associated with better quality of life across a range of other dimensions, life expectancy, health, diet quality, diet quality, rates of obesity and smoking, and frequency of mental health challenges. As you all well know, tertiary education is not just benefit individuals, it also makes our societies and our economies stronger. It provides businesses and governments with skilled workers. It develops entrepreneurs whose ideas are vital sources of dynamism in our economies. It supports the innovations needed to tackle our most pressing common challenges from pandemic response to climate change. It develops research to shed light on our changing societies to test and question assumptions and conventional wisdom to help expand the frontiers of human knowledge. And it helps young people, and indeed people of all ages, become informed citizens fully participating in our democratic processes at a time when growing numbers of citizens are dis dissociating themselves from traditional democratic processes. People with tertiary education are more likely to feel they have a say in what their government does. In the European Social Survey, only 6% of 25 to 64 year olds who did not complete upper secondary education reported feeling that their political system allows people like them to have some say in what their government does. That compares with 35% among those who completed upper secondary or post secondary non tertiary education and 52% among tertiary educated adults. This has implications for political participation. In a recent survey in the United States, 92% of those with a graduate degree said they had voted in the most recent federal election, compared to just 59% of those with no post-secondary education. Adults with tertiary qualifications are also less likely to believe in conspiracy theories. The European Social Survey, for example, found in 2020 that almost a third of adults with below upper secondary educational qualifications believed groups of scientists manipulate, fabricate, or suppress evidence in order to deceive the public, whereas this proportion was only 16% among those with tertiary education qualifications. You might think that that is still very high, and I would, I would tend to agree with you. Because of these linkages, a strong, vibrant, and effective higher education system can serve as an important policy lever for addressing the long-term structural challenges facing policymakers. First and foremost, boosting sustainable economic development and growth, 
And in the short term, the drags on growth are significant. The world is still grappling with the continuing impacts of Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine, the evolving conflict following Hamas terrorist attacks on Israel and geopolitical tensions more generally, as well as a rise in trade restricting measures that are putting pressure on our global trading system. And all of that at a time when we're facing deep structural challenges associated with the green and digital transformations and the economic and social impacts of population aging. Recent indicators suggest a mild slowdown in global growth. However, uh, we project global GDP to grow at a rate of 2.9% this year, 2.7% was last year, and 3% in 2025. However, even if labor markets have shown some easing, with job vacancies declining, unemployment remains low and labor markets remain rather tight. The OECD-wide unemployment rate at 4.9% in the third quarter of this year is in fact 1.8 percentage points below the average over the period 2011 to 2022. When I first went to university some 35 years ago, we were taught that an unemployment rate of 5% was in fact full employment. Skills and innovation will be absolutely critical to boost growth in response to both short-term pressures and more longer-term structural challenges. Alleviating shortages across OECD countries for key skills, including with respect to science, healthcare, digital technologies, uh, teaching and training. Developing new technologies and techniques in the energy sector to address the triple challenge of ensuring energy affordability, security and sustainability. And increasing the adoption of digital technologies, particularly for smaller businesses and for firms that are falling behind in the digital transformation. Contributions by tertiary education, including institutions of higher learning in terms of both skills development and research, will also be a core part of policymakers' response to long-term structural challenges, which includes the aging of our populations. The significant increase in life expectancy is one of the greatest achievements of the past half century, and overwhelmingly, I'm sure, we would all agree it's rather good news for all of us. However, the combination of longer lifespans and low fertility rates has caused a rapid aging of populations across the OECD. The median age across OECD countries was 34 in 2000, increasing to 40 in 2019, and is projected to increase further to 45 by the mid-2050s. I will spare you all the other stats uh, that um, are here in my speech, but let, suffice to say that the economic reality is that population aging is a drag on growth as well as a driver of increased costs for government. All other things being equal, it leads to lower workforce participation levels, which means lower productivity, lower growth, and consequently lower revenue for governments. At the same time, population aging drives increases uh, in public expenditure on pensions, healthcare, and long-term aged care. And Productivity growth is one of the key engines of economic growth. It's the key to sustainable increases in living standards. Productive businesses respond more quickly to changing market conditions. They use technology more effectively, including to keep operating during shocks and disruptions. But over the past two decades, productivity growth has slowed across OECD economies from 2% in the early 2000s to less than 1% before the pandemic hit. Furthermore, job reallocation rates and the share of startups among firms are down by more than 20% over the past two decades, which is an indication that our economies have become less dynamic. Our analysis suggests that a significant one-third of the gap between the most productive and medium firms is made up by the human side of productivity. In other words, skills, management, and diversity of the workforce. Of course, policymakers must also harness and mitigate disruptions from the green and digital transformations of our economies and societies. At least in the short run, the green transformation will involve winners and losers. In fact, both the green and digital transitions risk creating new divides. New firms will emerge, some will adapt, others will close. This will involve significant labor market churn. While job losses associated with decarbonization may be small, in aggregate, overall, they will be disproportionately larger in several sectors and regions and may affect public support for the transition. 
The net zero transition will progress more quickly and more effectively while citizens can see that achieving our climate goals is well aligned with their economic and social well-being. And the digital transformation will only reach its full potential if there is very broad opportunity for people to participate and benefit. So policymakers today face a range of challenges, both short-term and longer-term, and higher education through research and innovation, as well as teaching and learning, is at the core of helping us navigate those challenges in an effective and fair way. Higher education must respond to this evolving environment in labor markets, our economies and societies more broadly. And we will need to adapt to ensure that the content and format of learning continues to prepare students as effectively as possible. To optimize higher education's contributions, policymakers and universities like KU Leuven must work together to develop the new skills required in changing labor markets, to prepare students with high quality early primary and secondary education systems, to support alternative post-secondary education pathways such as vocational education and training, to encourage lifelong learning to enable older workers to adjust to changes in labor markets and as we live longer and live longer healthier to continue to participate in the labor market. To foster the innovations necessary to boost productivity and accelerate the green transition, to enhance equality of opportunity through access to high quality higher education and to ensure a sustainable funding model that reflects both the public benefits of higher education but also the comparatively higher private returns. Please let me address these objectives in turn. First on developing the skills of the future. The skills needs of our economies and societies are evolving. That's a statement of the obvious. Changing demographics and patterns of trade, the green and digital transformation, all offer new opportunities, but they also all carry a risk of job displacement for some. The OECD's skills outlook, which we released last month, found that demand for foundational skills like creativity, problem solving, critical thinking and leadership will continue to grow. Even now, on average, across the OECD, more than half of all current job shortages require a high level of skills while about 40% require a medium level of skills and only 6% require a low level of skills. By fostering these skills, higher education institutions will play a valuable role opening up opportunities for their students and enhancing their resilience to disruptions and transformations in labor markets. High skill occupations are at a lower risk of being disrupted through automation, particularly those related to the foundational skills I just mentioned. Strengthening enrollment in science, technology, and engineering programs more broadly will also be incredibly important to not just weather the impacts of disruption, but also to harness them for better opportunities. Across Belgium, 90% of people with tertiary qualifications in information and communication technologies are employed. And yet, this sector represents only tertiary entrants which is even below the very low OECD average of 6%. Artificial intelligence is a key growth area. Demand for AI skills is clearly and self-evidently on the rise with most opportunities opening up in professional services, information and technology, and in manufacturing. A 2020 OECD survey found that 42% of Belgian businesses with over 250 employees use some form of AI, from recruitment to operations, and that AI adoption is strongly associated with higher productivity in Belgium. Programming and data science skills are particularly sought after by employers in the AI space. At the same time, we can all agree that cognitive and transversal skills, like problem solving and critical thinking, remain uniquely human attributes that cannot be replaced by AI, and that higher education providers are uniquely placed to keep honing and developing those uniquely human attributes. The green transition will also have a massive impact on skills demand in our labor markets with new opportunities emerging in fields such as renewable energy generation and transmission, manufacturing for low carbon transportation, 
and renewable energy technologies, research into new industrial and agricultural methods, and many other areas. Our higher education systems must be ready to supply the right set of skills. A good example here at the KU Leuven, uh, where the is, is here at the KU Leuven, where the sustainability in the agri-food chain research group works on leveraging scientific research to support more sustainable business practices in that sector. Second, our societies must ensure high quality preparation for tertiary education and real alternatives to a university degree for those who choose another path. This includes a strong and important focus on high quality early childhood education. I mean, this is another area in which Belgium actually does comparatively well, with 97% of three-year-olds in Belgium in early childhood education. Belgium has one of the highest rights uh, of um, attendance of three-year-olds in early childhood education across the 81 countries around the world for which we have data. We know that the earlier children start developing foundational cognitive, social and emotional skills, the more likely they are to succeed in subsequent stages of education, including and in particular, higher education. The OECD has identified staff-child ratios, group sizes, the size of the educational space, well-designed curricula and minimum staff qualifications as the key drivers of quality in early education systems, and we help countries prioritize reforms to enhance the quality of their early childhood education systems. Our education systems must respond to the impacts of COVID-19 related learning disruptions. They must also adapt to digitalization, both the disruptions it brings to the classroom and the opportunities it brings to enhance learning experiences by adopting digital tools appropriately. While education was initially slow to fully harness the digital transformation, the pandemic created a new imperative for schools to use digital tools. It spurred a real wave of innovation and it demonstrated the value of digital tools in supporting and strengthening learning. Technology hasn't just helped maintain learning during school closures, it has really transformed it by enabling greater personalization, improving teaching effectiveness and enhancing learning assessments. However, the latest OECD program for student assessment report of PISA, as has already been referenced, which we released early this month, suggests that technology intensity in classrooms can also lead to poorer learning outcomes when it creates distractions instead of facilitating learning. Teacher involvement in the design of educational tools will be essential to get the balance right. While the focus on education, vocational education and training does have a critical role to play in providing good alternatives to university level education for those seeking another path, in equipping learners with practical skills to reduce school dropout rates and facilitate the school to work transition, in helping workers affected by automation and other changes in the labor market adapt to new opportunities, and in ensuring our economies and societies have the skills needed for the future, skilled nurses to care for an aging population, skilled electricians to enable the massive expansion of electrical infrastructure needed to cover future demands, skilled plumbers to install energy efficient heat pumps, and the list goes on. Too often, uh, vocational education and training is seen as a fallback option for students who struggle with school or lack motivation, rather than as a first choice that leads to an attractive career path. In Belgium, vocational education and training is more common than in other OECD countries. In 2022, 27% of 25 to 34 year olds had a vocational qualification as the highest level of educational attainment compared to 23% across the OECD. To further boost the attractiveness of vocational education and training, policymakers can strengthen pathways between vocational programs and other tertiary education opportunities. And quality, of course, also matters. Countries such as the Netherlands and Germany, whose apprenticeship systems ensure excellent school-to-work transitions through strong work-based learning components, have exceptionally low unemployment rates of less than 3% among young adults with vocational degrees. Third, 
on supporting lifelong learning to help cushion the impact of labor market disruptions and to respond to the aging of our populations. The rapid net zero transition coupled with the digital and the demographic transitions we're dealing with will mean significant structural shifts in the labor market. Over the short term, there will inevitably be winners and losers. It is essential then that governments and other key stakeholders ensure that everyone has the best possible opportunity to participate and benefit from transitions and to navigate the challenges in front of us. Uh, later, in, as we live longer and as we live longer healthier, uh, later retirement should be rewarded and age discriminatory policies and practices should be removed. Strikingly, only 24% of older adults participate in training or education compared to 47% of young adults in OECD countries. We really need to drive that cultural change towards lifelong learning, including in our universities. That means carefully thinking about whether existing programs and degree structures need to be adapted to help individually, individuals continually upgrade their skills as technology changes and to move the emphasis away from study and only at the beginning of a person's career. In the OECD's survey of adult skills, many respondents cited barriers, including to work or family commitments and financial costs as an obstacle to learning opportunities. Micro-credentials are an innovative tool for lifelong learning, providing flexible educational opportunities tailored to an individual's career objectives, schedule, and specific development needs. Uh, Ireland's uh, micro-creds initiative, which began in 2020, and Australia's new pilot micro-credential system for higher education will both provide valuable insights for other jurisdictions to consider uh, in the context of what is an innovative approach. Fourth, we must foster innovation, which will be critical to boost productivity, increase energy efficiency, to accelerate to sustainable transformation, in particular given that almost half of the reductions in carbon emissions needed to reach our 2050 targets will have to come from technologies that are not yet available or not yet available at scale. To optimize the benefits and the diffusion of digital technologies in fields such as generative artificial intelligence and quantum technologies, and to improve our society's resilience to shocks from pandemic preparedness to climate change mitigation. On average, across OECD countries, domestic investment in research and development as a share of GDP has increased slightly from 2.1% in 2000 to 2.7% in 2021. But within this average, some leading countries stand out. Israel at 5.6% of GDP in 2021, Korea at 4.9%, more than double what is invested as a share of GDP back in the year 2000. Uh, universities like KU Leuven are at the forefront of driving innovation through research and development, developing and supporting skilled researchers in both basic research, which is the backbone of long-term productivity gains, as well as applied research to leverage basic research into new applications, products, and services. The Center for Surface Chemistry developed an innovative solar panel that produces hydrogen gas without the carbon emissions associated with established methods using natural gas. Kai Leuven has also nurtured spin-off companies like Astrivax, which builds on the expertise, knowledge, and entrepreneurial spirit of its scientists to provide innovative vaccines that are easier to produce and offer long-lasting protection against viruses such as yellow fever. These are some examples in Leuven, in Belgium, there are many other examples across the world where the synergies between basic and applied research and development can help solve real problems. Finally, on enhancing equality of opportunity. Access to high quality education is what underpins the democratic promise of merit-based social mobility and equality of opportunity it empowers people to succeed. It gives students the tools to adapt to a rapidly changing world. We need higher education to continue to help make equality of opportunity a reality. This includes helping students from vulnerable households catch up. 
Our 2022 PISA assessment found that Belgium has one of the highest differences in mathematics performance between students in the top quarter and students in the bottom quarter in terms of socioeconomic status. The impacts can reverberate throughout an individual's working life. An OECD study found that in European OECD countries, working age adults who experienced disadvantaged childhoods are three to 6% less likely to be employed than those those with more favorable childhoods. Enhancing equality of opportunity also means tackling barriers and harnessing the untapped potential of underrepresented groups in higher education and labor markets. Our research suggests this can pay not just social but also economic dividends. Workforce skills, managerial talent, and diversity accounts for about one third of the productivity gap between the most and least productive firms. In fact, more gender and culturally diverse firms are more productive. Yet despite significant advances, young women are still less likely to pursue studies in fields like engineering, mathematics, and computing, which are typically characterized by higher pay compared to human and care-centered educational pathways and educations. This despite the fact that girls generally fare better than boys in science and reading scores in school, and their gap in mathematics scores has been steadily declining. Policymakers can support better gender balance in occupations dominated by women or men. This means starting early to help boys and girls make education choices based on their interests and skills rather than on stereotypical expectations. This will require school curricula and teaching practices that are not encumbered by these expectations, including building confidence in girls in their abilities in science and maths-focused education. Governments are expected to do it all in, in many ways must do it all. Ensure that the mix of student and public funding is fair given both individual and social benefits and is complemented by other financial supports for access to higher education where necessary. Determine the right balance between funding for higher education and other post-secondary institutions such as technical colleges reflecting future skills demand. Enhance support for lifelong learning and continue to support basic research, which is the foundation of so much of our needed in innovation today. And governments have to do all of that while ensuring fiscal to increasing pressure on public budgets. There's no simple answer to this challenge of dealing with competing objectives and, of course, uh, finding and prioritizing the necessary and each jurisdiction will take an approach that reflects the public's preferences and the particular circumstances and history of the education system. Looking forward, the OECD will continue to provide our comparative data and analysis to help identify best practices for getting that balance right, based on the data and evidence in terms of the outcomes that are achieved using different approaches. This is quite a long to-do list for education policymakers and higher education institutions, but I'm confident that you, that we, uh, that we are all up to the task. And the OECD, of course, will continue to be your partner in this process. The research of members of distinguished universities like KU Leuven provides vital input to our efforts to provide comparative data, identify policy best practice, based on evidence bias, and promote common standards for a better world. The OECD shares with you a drive to harness data, evidence, and knowledge for a better world. So to conclude, I would like to end on a note of optimism. It is true that the scale and the complexity of the challenges we now face might seem daunting and immensely complex. But we've also never been more equipped to address those challenges. We have never been this well educated, never understood more about our natural world and about the risks we're facing, never had so much access to technology, never had this degree of innovation and adaptability, and never had so many opportunities for effective international exchange and cooperation, including at the OECD. We do have the tools to make sure that our higher education systems are effective, adaptive, innovative, and accessible, and ultimately 
serve to create a world full of opportunities as well as a bright future for all our citizens. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address you tonight and, and I hope I wasn't too long. So thank you very much uh, for this uh, very inspiring uh, lecture, but also advice that you give us, governments, uh, and all actors in society. We just have to continue working is uh, what I uh, certainly picked up. But also we should uh, uh, be optimistic, and uh, uh, I agree with you that we are well equipped for, um, uh, for uh, tackling all the challenges that we are facing. Uh, but apart from that, I think we uh, we also have to uh, probably convince each other about what we think is the best way to go forward. And there certainly are different solutions to all the problems that we have uh, been analyzing. Uh, and finding the right answers to these sol uh, solutions is uh, probably something that is also going to uh, trigger some of the questions. So we have now, uh, I think, good 20, 25 minutes for uh, a Q&A. So I would like to invite you to come back to the stage. You will get a microphone uh, then, Mr. Corman. Um, and uh, we also have asked our Vice Rector, uh, Tina Baalmans, to um, give a couple of perspectives from uh, higher education, and in particular, the education uh, at our university, uh, and maybe also some first reflections on uh, what, uh, what we have heard today. So uh, Tina Baalmans, uh, Vice Rector for Educational Policy, uh, at Kai Leuven, you get, get a couple of minutes uh, to, uh, to try to uh, summarize your initial thoughts. Yeah, so thank you, Peter, for giving me the, the floor, and thank you, Mr. Corman, for your very nice lecture, which I enjoyed very much, and I think I, I share a lot of your insights, and thank you for sharing them. It becomes so clear that um, the choices that we have to make for by the universities and how to go on with this future proof, proof universities are crucial. And you showed that you you gave ample of examples on on that, um, and you connected it to the challenges we are envis envisaging in society: green uh, transformation, digital transformation, social transformation, and, and so on. Um, and yes, there were a lot of ambitions that you addressed, huh? being playing a role in, in, in um, teacher training for primary and secondary schools, but also for educating our students and lifelong learning. And it, it's a lot, it's a lot, and, and that's all within the financial constraints we are in. I might, um, as an engineer by formation, by training, um, though also disagree with you, and so that might open the debate, and that's the... Uh, the debate on uh, the doubt on the impact of on in the future on AI. And not to say that I believe that it will not have an, in, in, um, an impact at all, but uh, I think we should not underestimate the impact it will have. And uh, I was a little bit triggered by the fact that you said that creativity is an essential human skill, whereas I think that uh, if not in present generations of the AI tools, already creativity is in, um, especially when we start using AI and um, learning networks together with what we know from fundamental laws of, of physics, uh, societal behavior, and, and so on. And so I think this is also a challenge for us in the education to, to find a way of bringing um, a way of educating transferable skills, uh, creativity and problem solving attitudes, um, responsible citizenship from our students, which is very important, I think, uh, how to do that. And we might need as, as uh, lecturers, as, as professors, as researchers to, to find and to try um, to foster that learning and to bring this um, knowledge and, and skills to our students um, by thinking on a more meta level, bringing a kind of scaffold in, in our education um, for 
really elevating the AI tools that, that will be brought uh, in, in, in society anyway. And, and so the, the way how we to have to tackle education, that's really something, um, an additional challenge I would like to bring up here. And I will leave it by that. Thank you for the inspiring talk again. And I will give the, the mic back to Thank you. you. Thank you, Tine, uh, for, uh, uh, for these uh, uh, reflections. So uh, I now would like to give the floor to the room uh, for some questions. There is one in the back and then two here. So that's three already. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, can I, find you maybe it, also I found the comment interesting me, can, on can, can conspiracy you also theories. Is there a bit of yourself? feedback here or not? Yeah. Can you shortly introduce yourself? Oh, well? sorry. My name's Lucy, and I'm a student here at KU Leva. Um, yeah. Uh, I, the first thing was I found it interesting that you mentioned conspiracy theories and that rate going up for people without a high education. Whereas um, I think it was in 2019 you said that the net zero target for Australia proposed by the Labor Party would be reckless and irresponsible, which I, I think is slightly conspiratorial thinking. Um, and the other thing I want to mention is... In 2020, Dan Tian, who was a Minister of Education at the time for, for your party, um, also had a similar scheme of making sure that education was future-proof and job-ready. And we saw that the uh, consequence of that scheme was actually massively defunding humanities. So fees went from about 20000 oh, has it gone off here? Yeah, $20,000 to $40,000 to get a humanities education. And... Um, I, I, it just seems to me that that goes against that Clive James quote that you said before of uh, the value of education being incalculable and intrinsic. It seems to be a quite reductionist economic rationality that um, that you're applying there to education. Human, uh, humanities education, as many people know, it isn't necessarily the most financially prosperous way of getting education, but it definitely has uh, quite a large interpersonal and spiritual effect. So defunding humanities doesn't seem a great way to promote prosperity for a society. Well, thank, thank you very much. Uh, the, the Australian domestic politics is following me all the way to uh, Kai Leuven, which is great. So firstly, on the, on the, on the first uh, question, um, that is a, an incomplete quote. And just to put, I mean, it's, this is a very important conversation. It was a very important conversation in an Australian context. Um, the debate in Australia, the mainstream debate in Australia was between those, uh, was, was not about whether or not we should achieve net zero emissions. It was how that is best done. Uh, and the political quote uh, in the context of a political debate that, that you just referenced was essentially about making the point to pursue policies in one individual jurisdiction in a way that shifts emissions to other parts of the world where emissions for the same level of economic output are going to be higher doesn't help us achieve a global emissions, emissions reduction objective. Um, you know, we, we have a global challenge. We have a global challenge of getting, so we have a global challenge of getting to net zero emissions at a global level. The challenge we have is that countries around the world are pursuing different approaches. Uh, and unless we can find a globally more coherent and better coordinated way uh, to pursue uh, climate action, we will not actually end up solving the problem. And the, and the point uh, that was part of the political debate in Australia at the time was if we require people to make sacrifices which they then see shift economic activity and jobs into countries in the neighborhood with which businesses in Australia are competing, they're losing their jobs and they're losing income levels, only to then be told that it not only doesn't solve the climate problem, but it makes the problem worse because emissions are going to be higher for the same level of economic output by firms in other countries that Australian firms are competing with, well, then that doesn't solve the problem. And, I mean, this is actually one of the initiatives that I have pursued uh, and which the 38 member countries of the OECD uh, have supported is uh, the so-called inclusive form on carbon mitigation approaches, which uh, seeks to help 
uh, optimize the global emissions reduction impact of individual emissions reduction efforts in countries around the world through better data and information sharing, the best traditions of the OECD, by facilitating evidence-based mutual learning, but also by providing a platform for inclusive multilateral dialogue on how we can avoid some of the negative cross-border spillover effects. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I think that you, you, you sort of took a, a very brief quote out of a political pre-election debate context without putting in the broader context. So I hope I've sort of been able to adjust that a, a little. Now, in terms of uh, access to higher education, Australia's got a fantastic system. And it was actually, it was a system that was first introduced by uh, a Labor government so that, you know, I was part of the uh, right of center uh, coalition government and it was the Labor government that introduced a system uh, where, uh, a so-called HEX system, where everybody, everybody can access uh, higher education. Um, whichever field of uh, um, endeavor uh, they pursue, but um, there, is, there is a fee that they don't have to pay up front. You pay it back through the tax system once you earn above a certain level of income. Um, the, the, the lower your income, the less you pay, or in fact you don't pay anything up until a particular threshold, and you start making payments through, your, through the tax system once your income goes above a certain level. And I mean, that is, that is very fair. Nobody's excluded uh, up front because of their socioeconomic background from accessing uh, higher education. But also, people make a contribution back into the system as a result of the higher private returns that they are able uh, to secure for themselves and for their family as a result of the uh, higher education benefit that they've been able to receive uh, thanks to the support provided by society. And I mean, I think, I think the Australian system is fair. Um, I, you know, every system can be improved and, and you know, there's uh, an ongoing conversation in Australia, as I know uh, there is, uh, you know, in, in other countries around the world, including here in Belgium, on how the funding arrangements between public and private uh, contributions uh, to uh, education can be further improved. Thank you. Yeah, indeed, uh, uh, tuition fees is an important issue and it uh, is different in various parts of the world. There were two questions here. I suggest we take these two questions together and then uh, um, give the floor back. I didn't know what my colleague was going to answer. Uh, gonna ask no, no, you, you go but, first yeah. and then he okay. comes. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, your Excellency, thank you for your uh, speech. I am Anir Bandas. I am part of the Master of Advanced Studies in European Policies and Public Administration. Uh, my question pertains to uh, part of what you addressed about the risk of job displacement, uh, and particularly within the context of AI. Uh, as per a recent survey done by Pearson in India, it is feared that 16 million workers would face job displacement in the next decade due to uh, automation. Uh, particularly in the manufacturing uh, industry and so on, uh, and secondly, followed by agriculture. Uh, I'm concerned that, you know, uh, given also the disruptions uh, due to the pandemic, uh, there, there would be a massive skill deficit, and I, I, I wonder how uh, we can upskill and reskill uh, these workers which were kind of like left behind during the pandemic. We couldn't give them the formal vocational training. And uh, I wonder, like, how, how do we, uh, at an institutional level, prepare for, you know, addressing the skills deficit in the, in, in the years ahead? Thank uh, you. I mean, I mean you're, you're quite right. There's a risk of a skills gap, a skills deficit, and, and, and that is something that collectively we have to find a way to tackle. I mean, and, you know, there, are different, there are several uh, structural transformations uh, happening, and I mean, there's the, the, the green transformation, there's the technological transformation, and there's the AI piece. Um, there is uh, the population aging aspect, as I mentioned before. And, you know, our education system does have to adapt and gear up to ensure that the uh, skills that are needed going forward um, are going to be available for our economies and our societies. Now, um, I, I, I do take, a, I've got to say, I do take an overall optimistic view. Um, I mean, I think, I think that we will be able to uh, manage. And, and I also, I mean, innovation has always changed the makeup of labor markets forever in a day, and it will continue to change the makeup of, of the labor market. And, and, and we've got to ensure that in the continuum of you know, education, training, 
uh, into the labour market as it will be, that we that we have the right that we have the right settings. And I mean that was sort of really a core focus of what I was trying, I guess, to suggest. Uh, in my in my remarks tonight, and I mean, that is something where policymakers, uh, educational institutions, and other stakeholders ha have to really think about how, how we can how we can best do that. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, if I may add to that, I, I think that's exactly the reason why we, as an association, K Leuven, should combine in lifelong learning both the academic positions and the vocational training that can be done by by our. Um, uh, colleges, university colleges, and, and that's exactly so. Feeding from research, feeding from data, what is what is needed for society, and then come over with programs to exactly uh, in an agile will, way transform and and, and learn the um, the vocational skills or other skills that are needed for tomorrow. Thank you. Um. I'm Nico Poleichner, student of international law, and uh, also here from the KU Leuven. And first of all, I would also like to thank you for being here with us today. My question would be on um, the unprecedented rise of overqualified employment in Europe, with states of uh, Spain and Greece uh, reaching numbers of 32-34% with nationals, and then especially looking at non-nationals and non-EU um, uh, non-EU citizens of numbers going up to 65-70% uh, where they're working in jobs where, um, in which they can't use effectively their probably even present or present uh, tertiary education from their home countries. And as this number is also ever rising, I was wondering whether that is an effect um, due to states not being able to adapt uh, with their economies or with policies to recognition, to the integration of these persons and their education into the systems, um, or if there's some underlying problem. You already touched the concepts and ideas of uh, a lot of people, especially coming from secondary education, thinking that uh, tertiary education would be the only and first step to, to go for, and then having other options rather as uh, some kind of plan B, and then in regards to that, my second question would be, is there some kind of uh, dream of an ever-rising entrance into the job or workforce for which tertiary education is needed? Or is it exactly just that, an unrealistic expectation that it is possible for all students, for example, here, especially in um, Belgium, or oh, sorry, I come from in Germany, that it is possible to, to go into jobs for, of tertiary education? Well, the, the first point I would make is that, you know, despite having gone through a pretty challenging period with the one in a 100 year pandemic um, and the economic impact of that and, and the economic impact in particular across Europe uh, of, um, you know, the, the energy price shock f as in the wake of uh, Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine, when I mean, given all of the challenges in the global economy, um, labor markets around the world have proven incredibly resilient and, I mean, labor markets uh, are actually very tight still, um, and when I, as I travel around um, countries around the world, like more often than not, uh, governments talk to me about skills shortages and how they can attract more appropriately skilled uh, workers and employees in, in, into the labour markets. And there's a real competition globally between countries trying to attract. Uh, you know, people in, into their economies. The, the, the second, so, and, and, and I think I made that comment in my remarks as well. I mean, there's been a massive increase in the number of uh, tertiary educated, um, uh, tertiary qualified um, uh, workers into the, into the labor market. Um, and even so, employment rates are very, very high. Um, and, you know, what, what we find is that in countries around the world that experience uh, continued tight labor markets with continued um, high levels of skills shortage, they become more and more pragmatic when it comes to mutual recognition of um, skills obtained in other uh, jurisdictions. And I mean, that's certainly, I mean, when, when I look at Australia in, 19, in the mid 90s when I arrived and at Australia like in the mid 2000s, uh, it was a very different situation when it came uh, to recognition of um, skills obtained in, in, in other jurisdictions around the world. And, th and that is something that is happening. Uh, in, in other places. So, I mean, my, my, look, I mean, I certainly take the view that not everyone, I mean, vocational education and training should be um, like a valued pursuit in its own right. 
um, and it shouldn't just be seen as a second best option and, and not everyone uh, should um, you know, be pushed down the tertiary education path. But, um, I mean, so far, the, the very uh, the, the significantly increased levels of uh, tertiary qualified entrance into the labor market has not led uh, to, um, you know, very high levels of um, uh, unemployed tertiary qualified. Now, I mean, you, ra you raise the point of um, people are overqualified for the job they do. Um, that is, to a degree, a function of a career quite often, too. Um, I mean, you develop, I mean, one of the one of the natures of the labour market today, compared to what it was 20, 30, 40 years ago, is that you are more likely than not to have several careers in in a lifetime, and and that is also where the upskilling and reskilling and uh, you know additional um, opportunities to pursue higher education comes in. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Corman, for this uh, exciting lecture. I'm Christophe de Witte. Um, I'm a professor in education economics here at the KU Leuven. Um, you were mentioning the pension reforms. We didn't see the, the report yet, but I think that in Belgium we don't shine out in this report. You mentioned also education. We, again, we don't shine out. We, we decrease over time massively in PISA and uh, in pearls and all kinds of other tests. Uh, on the other hand, we do know what to do. There are commissions for pensions, there are commissions for education, so uh, it's very hard to, to take the right actions. And always in the very end, there is one stakeholder who, who stops the, the treatment, who stops the deal. Um, I was wondering, using your expertise, using your uh, Belgian background, using your international experience, but all, uh, all, yeah, also using your uh, background at the OECD, what should we do and how can we convince people, how can we convince all stakeholders to take the right actions, both in pensions, both in education, uh, in all sectors in, uh, in, 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 in society? So what are the tricks and tips that you would share with us? Well, you, I, I, you, I, 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 I don't in, think. Uh, I just want to mention, are you now inviting uh, Mr. Corman to become a Belgian politician? Or, uh, yeah, we do need in a few years a Belgian Minister of Education, so maybe <laughs> that would be a good uh, topic for you. Um, look, there are no tricks. Like, I mean, the truth is, like, um, structural reforms, and in, in particular structural reforms that are contested between different perspectives, you can only achieve them through the front door, and, and that is by engaging uh, in open and transparent conversation. And I guess one of the things that we're trying to do from an OECD point of view, and, and you know, we have the benefit, you know, I've been on the other side, I've been, you know, part of a, of a government where you've, you know, where you are democratically and politically responsible and you're democratically and politically challenged and you know implementing uh, structural reform is not easy um, in, in particular when you are uh, you know trying to disrupt the status quo over the short term in, in the pursuit of medium to long term uh, benefits and, and you know when you have to argue the trade-offs between you know essentially uh, you know improving things over the medium to long term that that is all very well but the politics often can be more in the short term. And I guess you know, what, we, what we're trying to do from an OECD point of view is, as was mentioned before, is put the mirror up with objective data and information, with objective comparable data and information. Now on, on, on PISA, I mean, I think that most countries around the world are beating themselves up thinking that they're the worst. I mean, let me say, I mean, around the world what we've seen is that there has been a significant drop in performance between 2018 and 2022, and we had a big pandemic uh, in, in the period in between, um, which caused, which obviously had a big negative impact. But I mean, I, I would like to think that countries around the world, including Belgium, look at PISA not f to beat themselves up on how bad things are, but look at PISA f to sort of see the insights and, and the opportunities on how the system can be improved from where it is to where it can be. I mean, look at the things that have worked uh, around um, the world in, in other places and, and see whether they can be adapted and, uh, and implemented, I implemented here. But, you know, but in the end, um, you know, structural reform that um, you know, involves perhaps sacrifices over the short term in order to achieve better outcomes over the medium to long term are not politically easy. I mean, that, that's a fact. And the only way you are going to achieve them is by engaging in co con continuous open and transparent conversation that should be as objective and data and evidence-based as possible and, and try and convince people 
uh, of uh, what it is that you're trying to achieve and why, and, and why there is, I mean, uh, you know, in the end, it, we, I mean, we, we do need to take we do need to take the time to ensure that a consensus is actually a genuine consensus if we want structural reform to be able to uh, sustain over time. Okay, thank you. There is a question in the back, and then here in the front, and then uh, there is, I think, after that, room for one more question. Cool. Uh, thank you, Mr. Coleman. Uh, my name is Sophia, and I'm doing a humanities degree uh, at K11. Um, and I was going back to what my colleague Lucien just mentioned. So you've mentioned the importance of particular vocations and science-based degrees, for example, for the future labor market. You've also mentioned the importance of education fostering critical thinking. I was wondering where the humanities fit into this. So as my colleague and as you've mentioned, uh, you were active in the Liberal Party in Australia, which after the pandemic cut down funding and nearly doubled the price of humanities degrees while cutting those on mathematics and on sciences. And obviously you, you said, okay, well, um, it's a bit of a different situation, but it did function to deter a lot of people from doing something like a humanities degree, for example. Um, and KU Leuven, at least for me, and maybe my other Australian colleagues, for example, was um, a breath of fresh air, shall we say, um, from the uncomfortable situation in Australia. So I guess where I'm heading with this is, do you think somewhere like KUL or other Belgian institutions ought to be employing a similar model to Australia in this sense? Uh, and where do the humanities fit into the picture, since perhaps they might not be the most economically profitable for the continuously changing labour market. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's, I'm really pleased that you have such a great experience at KU Leuven. I, I had too. Uh, it's, um, I, and, and I love hearing the Aussie accent. Uh, it makes me feel uh, like, like home. I mean, I, I didn't, I wasn't part of the government after uh, the pandemic. So, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, but uh, I left the government in November 2020. But let me just make the general point, uh, as I uh, did to your colleague, Lucien. I mean, I think that the Australian higher education system uh, is um, very fair in the way it is funded. I think it's very fair in uh, that it facilitates, generally facilitates universal access, uh, irrespective of uh, socioeconomic background. Yes, there is a share uh, in terms of uh, contributing to the cost of a degree uh, that, is, uh, um, that is provided through a progressive tax system based on capacity to pay after uh, having uh, undergone uh, your degree. Now, there will be a diversity of views uh, in relation to that, and I understand that, and, and you, know, you clearly uh, are of the view that the cost uh, should be lower. Uh, but, you know, in the end, um, in, in, in the context of a government where you've got to uh, prioritize uh, unlimited expectations into limited resources, you, you've got to make judgments. And in, in Australia, successive governments of both political persuasion have made relevant judgments. And, and, I mean, I think the system overall works very well. I'm not suggesting that Belgium should adopt... Uh, the uh, Australian system. I mean, I think that Belgium needs to make its own judgments and F Flanders needs to make uh, its own judgments, but I'm really so happy that you're having a good time in Leuven. It's a great place. <laughs> There's a question here in the front. Uh, yes. Thank you. Your Excellency, thank you, thank you um, for your lecture, which, which was very insightful. My name is Andrea. I am a student of political sciences here in Leuven. Uh, in your lecture, you underlined the need for uh, critical thinking in education as well as in the workplace, and uh, as well as uh, the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on education. Uh, do, you be, do you believe that the, um, the current fusion of in-person education and online could have an impact on that skill that is as, as, you, as you said, very required in the, on the, in the workplace and in education? Uh, look, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question. And look, um, in the context of the pandemic, uh, countries across the OECD closed their schools for differing, differing periods. One of the things that Belgium actually did very well is that the school closures in Belgium were comparatively short compared to 
other countries across the OECD. But when we look at, I mean, countries around the world, including here, had to very quickly switch uh, to uh, an online offering when it comes uh, to education. What we found is that, you know, where that had the least negative impact or the best positive impact is where the student that was all of a sudden going from in-person contact to online learning felt that they had access to the teacher to get uh, advice and support, you know, even as required. Um, I mean, the, the discipline required to pursue autonomous uh, learning in, in the context of, a, of, like, I guess, an online uh, learning setting is, 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 is very different to when you're all physically in, in the classroom. And, and so there is data that actually shows on how through uh, appropriate programs and appropriate opportunity for um, student, teacher engagement in the context of an online um, learning setting, you can optimize or, or at least avoid the negative impacts uh, from uh, that sort of changed uh, education arrangement. So, I mean, I would really commend people to look very closely at what PISA has been able to identify there on, on how online learning outcomes can be generally optimized, including in, in, in uh, primary and high school settings. Thank you. Hmm? Yes. yes yep. Perhaps I, I may add to that that for our K-11 students, at least, I don't think the online uh, switch during the pandemic really helped a lot uh, at that time, but I think the whole community here became much more uh, aware of the fact that there was a rethinking on how to set up a course and, and we had a support team um, that was strengthened and so on, which I think is leverage to help students for critical thinking in, in their training, but not because of going online or going blended, but because of total construction of the course design, which is very important. And uh, a second thing I really um, hope is that AI can bring us making students more in critical thinking because it's a lack, um, which is also known from studies, that we are not that good at all in higher education to uh, really support the, um, the skills of critical thinking today. So we have still a huge way to go there. And I hope that by seeing all the things that come out from, from AI tools that we can have more tools to, um, to provide the skills and to train and foster the critical thinking. Thank you. So enhancing quality is, of course, a uh, continuing effort for us as a university. Um, I have not seen any more hands, so I take the privilege of being a moderator to ask a final question, maybe to both of you. And this is about the quality of lifelong learning, because uh, we are now um, really overwhelmed by so many offers that come from everywhere, giving, uh, giving uh, lifelong learners of every generation a certificate. Uh, but on the other end, we as uh, higher education providers are also very much interested in offering our research-based uh, knowledge in uh, some specific modules that we also want to quality assure. How do you see that evolving in, in OECD countries or globally, uh, the competition between what uh, the traditional higher education education system has to offer in lifelong learning trajectories versus what is sometimes uh, a commercial business model? Uh, well, look, I mean, f firstly, I mean, there is a real need for lifelong learning and that, you know, yes, I mean, there is, there is a question on how you structure your uh, higher education offering, but there's also a real cultural shift that has to happen, like, I guess, you know, on, on the people side of, of, of the equation. And, and the truth is that right now, uh, as I mentioned in my remarks, I mean, the, the older um, segment of um, the workforce is, is less likely to keep engaging in uh, you know, ad additional skills development and learning than the younger uh, segment in, in, the, in the labor market. But you know, in terms of uh, um, what higher education um, systems could or should do, I mean, I, I, I'm very attracted to you know, what Ireland and what Australia and others are doing in terms of the micro-credentials type approach to really come up with, uh, in, instead of looking at a degree and a fully fledged um, um, sort of program that takes a, a lot of time and, and is you know, very comprehensive, I mean, to have real sort of targeted 
uh, which might not, it's not traditionally what universities do, but having very targeted um, credential arrangements that, that can respond to specific uh, skills requirements in, in, in you know, specific areas. I mean, I think that that is, that is something that we really uh, should explore on how that can be properly tailored to, to help meet a demand. Yeah, I, I think we um, we really have and we are looking into the the, the format that micro credentials can bring us. Um, at the same time, I think we should not go into the competition that is uh, already there and where the market already does its job, but that we should um, base ourselves back to what we are, where we are good at, which is the innovation, the uh, problem solving skills, the interdisciplinarity, which we can have with this uh, university and uh, really go from, well, start from our strengths and, and give added value uh, to, the, to the society, also with these micro-credentials. Okay, on that note, uh, I would like to thank you very much again uh, for this uh, fantastic uh, lecture and the uh, good answers on sometimes critical questions as well. Um, Tine, also thanks to you for joining the stage and uh, I uh, thank you all for being here with us, uh, either physically or online, and we will see each other again at another uh, uh, ambassador's lecture uh, probably soon, maybe also at Christmas somewhere. Thank you. Thank you.